there any questions that you guys would like for me to clarify before we move on to the next chapter? Here's what I want you to do. Before you guys leave here, I'm going to go person by person by person and ask you what you need me to clarify for you. So somewhere on a piece of paper, I know I like to write everything in the front of my book, because that way I don't lose, because I never lose my books, and write down things you need to for me, from me. Before you leave, I'm going to make sure everybody gets every single question answered. All right, I want you guys to have nothing you're wondering about. Same you guys. All right, yesterday we dealt with measurements and ownerships. Today we're going to move on to rights and land, the things that the government can do with your real estate. Okay, so it's land use controls and regulations. Your government rights and lands is peaked, and it, it would consist of police power, eminent domain, taxation, and as cheap. Okay, well, I'll just explain all these to you. Okay, first of all, your police power, do we have any officers in here? No one's gonna arrest another student? It's happened, that's why I'm saying it. Okay, um, yeah, we had a, a, co a cop arrest a student for a DUI like the night before class started. Oh, wow. And the student the student was all hung over, going, looking at the cop going, dude, you look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I should, I arrested you last night. <laughs> they they spent the class together. It's all <laughs> I know. I know. How'd you get here today? <laughs> I wonder who had the video. Oh, it was, it was, it was, the guy was just like, oh, okay, dude. Uh, <laughs> okay, so police power is, is anything that protects the public. So that would include things like zoning. Zoning, does zoning protect the public? Yes. Building codes, you don't want building codes to, uh, you don't want buildings falling down on you, you want to make sure that they're um, it's safe, basically safe, right? And rent control, sometimes some, uh, I'm going to take that off, but some areas of the country, they'll, they'll establish rent control um, to take over police power, but it's not good. It's, it's, it's not good. Um, what happens with rent control? When, rent, when I've seen rent control go into neighborhoods, the renters always come out to vote for it. And I had a, here's an example of what happened to one of my girlfriends who had eight units in Santa Monica, and all her units were rented at two bedrooms at the time. They were at 860. You know, 860, that was like cheap back then. And rent control came in. And what happened was she was not allowed to raise the rents, but all the tenants subleased for twenty five hundred a month. She was not allowed to evict anybody. That's what rent control does. It's just a it's a way of transferring money from the person who took the risk to the to someone else to transfer money. But anyways, Mississippi is a landlord state, which is nice. Another reason I came here. Okay. State enabling rights, though, so if it includes zoning, because think about zoning. Each city is allowed to do their own zoning because of state enabling rights or state enabling laws. You don't want an elementary school next door to a truck factory where trucks are coming and going, right? That could be dangerous. So the city will segregate out areas where certain things need to be. Every city will base their zoning on what's called a comprehensive plan or a master plan, and every city has it. They usually set out 20 years or 10 years. Okay, like 2030, Harrison County has a comprehensive plan. I know Biloxi has a comprehensive plan. You can look up your city, and it will tell you what the direction of the city is going. What <laughs> Fix them, bro. Oh, you guys. I got prop properties down there. Yeah, they've been having road issues. Road issues, yeah. So, anyways, everybody has one. It's a comprehensive plan. That's what they're going to be basing your zoning on. And what does zoning do? It implements your city or county's master plan. They ask you the definition of zoning. That's what it does. Implements your city or county's master plan. 
And these are the most frequently used zoning, would be commercial, industrial, residential, and agriculture. And when you start looking at maps, when you get into real estate, you'll see uh, that it's pretty consistent where you'll have industrial out here on the outskirts, then you'll have commercial, and then you'll have, you could have some type of residential, but instead of doing single family homes right away, they may put a park as a buffer zone or they uh, might do a park and then townhomes and then after townhomes, then they'll put uh, single family residences after that. What they try to do is they try to keep, okay, where do all the kids live in your neighborhood? Do they live in condos, townhomes or single family homes? Single, single family homes. That's who we're trying to protect. So you notice your, your industrial and your commercial is always away from the single family homes. If you don't fit the type of zoning that your area is zoned or has been rezoned and you've already been there, you were grandfathered in and you were allowed to continue on whatever it was that you owned. Okay, you're grandfathered in. My first property was two cottages on a lot. It was two, um, 400, I think they were 460 square feet each. I had a tiny home before it was popular. So it was considered a duplex, but they were individual units, cottage and cottage, okay, really small, 460. And I remember when I signed the paperwork, I had to sign a piece of paper that I knew that that neighborhood was down zoned. And what down zone mean is they're trying to down the amount of people that live in that neighborhood. And it said, you're, you're in a down zoning neighborhood, you are allowed to continue as a duplex or you know two cottages on a lot you have been grandfathered in but you have to sign that you understand that if this these two cottages burn down or fall down you have to build a single family home all right but i was grandfathered in until that point okay and i signed it and when i sold it it had no bearing on it on anything really okay so this would be a non-conformal uh conforming use let's say uh, a guy puts up a TV sales. This reminds me of Pass Road where you see all those resident houses now turning into like little businesses. There may come a time again where they say, okay, let's, that's too much traffic there. Let's down zone it and only allow residential here. Okay, but who's ever there gets to stay. Okay, so here's an example of what it would look like a TV sales. If um, you want to put a new thing in there, it's been down zoned, but you want to still have your business in that area, you go and get a conditional use permit. And the most common conditional use permits across the country are neighborhood grocery stores. Well, you'll see a little store in a corner or a neighborhood health clinic, like just little stores that they allow people to, to open up in neighborhoods. Those are the two most common. Before you are issued a conditional use permit, you have to hold, or the city or the county will hold, a public hearing. And when you have a public hearing, you'll see signs posted on the lot or the property that they want the change on. Has anybody ever driven through the neighborhood and it'll say public hearing? You see those signs? And if you go up close, you'll find the date and time and where to go for the public. So the first thing you do is, is your public hearing. Okay, let's say that you own a house and on, the zoning says that you have to be, you cannot build anything unless it's six feet from your side of your property line. So you have to count six feet. Okay, but you want a fence, you want a fence there because you're on the corner lot and nobody else is on the other side. So you want a zoning variance. You're not going to be changing the use of the property, but you want to vary what the zoning is and you want to move your fence six feet further to the street okay so that's your different so i would like to build a gazebo in my backyard but the setbacks from the back lot line doesn't give me enough room can i get a variance or uh i want to add a second story and it's a one-story neighborhood could i get a variance if you're not changing the use you just do something that the zoning says you can't be doing Spot zoning. Spot zoning is when you take one particular lot and you want to develop it, and you go and um, go to the city and say, you know, I know this is a 100% residential property, but I want this particular lot spot zoned, one particular thing for one particular reason. They do it when they're going to put the health clinics in, and they do it when they're going to do the grocery stores. But um, 
but cities and counties traditionally do not like to do spot zoning because they often get accused of favoritism. You see how that could work, right? It's your friend that's getting that. And you're just spot zoning that. I would like to do that too. Okay, so spot zoning sometimes causes trouble. Bulk zoning. Bulk zoning is um, when you're going to build a PUD, a plan unit development. Anybody name a PUD around here? Tradition. That's right. A PUD, plan unit development, is not a developer going in and doing one row of houses. It's the entire neighborhood. We're going to zone it. Here's um, what section 16 going to have? School. Oh, section 16 always has schools. That's right. Um, and then we're going over here. We're going to have the post office, and right next to the post office, we're going to have the grocery store. And then over here, we're going to have park, and over here, we're going to have townhomes. What are townhomes on the test called? Garden, Garden homes. homes. What are those walls on those wow. patios? <laughs> Very good. You guys weren't supposed to learn anything. See what happened? <laughs> Okay, the so bulk zoning would be like you're just doing a whole big area. Incentive zoning. This is where I made a lot of my money in was incentive zoning. Um, there's a lot of money to be made in incentive zoning. Incentive zones become incentive zones because no one wants to build a business there, or build a house there, or build a neighborhood there. Those are those, those, That's my home. Those are my areas where I love. I got paid... Um, <laughs> In Long Beach, California, the city called me up and said, we know that you buy, you specialize in like four units, three units. So we have three buildings that were crack houses that we seized, and we will help you or any of your clients buy these. So we had a, we had a client from New Zealand, Todd, who later became a broker in my office. Um, he came in and he, he said, yeah, I can buy two. I said, okay, well, here's three. Why don't you go look at these three and when and I wanted to buy all three, but he was a client. I was like, now buy whatever you don't buy. He goes, okay. So he spent the whole day looking at him. He came in the next morning. He goes, yeah, I want to buy these two. And I was like, all right, I'll take this one. And he was like, oh, what's so great about that one? <laughs> I was like, you, didn't, you didn't take it. That's what's so great. So he goes, look, I need another day. So he had to go look at that one. <laughs> I didn't even know which one it was. Um, <laughs> So anyway, he picked his two and I picked my one and uh, it was a crack house on 10th Street and um, I'll never forget walking into the closing, we don't use attorneys there, but they, we use uh, title escrow companies and the broker in the office is responsible for the closing. I'm like, here, your attorneys are responsible, which is good. Okay. Um, so I remember walking into the, um, the escrow office. I had a check for $15,000 to close the property. And they gave me a deed to the property paid in full and thirty thousand dollars to fix it. And Todd got the same type of stuff on his too. So they paid me to take it. They were crack houses in crack neighborhoods. And I was like, no problem. I will take that. They gave me a building and gave me money with it. Think about that. Four years later, we sold it for four sixty. Oh wow! Just some investors in Orange County. All right, because what happened in these? So you didn't have to have to hold that property for a certain amount. No, of time. they just wanted to clean up the neighborhood. I did not have to hold it for a certain amount of time. Okay, <laughs> um, on incentive zoning, I love incentive zonings because once that neighborhood starts turning, they turn very quickly, and I can always tell the neighborhoods that are moving to me. I could tell that are either incentivized or are moving and being corrected, moving to the right side, getting redeveloped because I always look for paint buckets. That's the first thing people do is they start painting the outside of the building. And I gotta tell you, when I bought that and my client Todd was a couple streets over on his two, he bought his then another couple streets over, we all painted at the same time. People that lived in that neighborhood for the longest time got re-inspired. And they were like, I love that. It's not, they call it ghetto gray, like this gray in, in, in um, most of the neighborhoods and everybody's painted gray because it's an easy color to paint graffiti over. You know, to I mean, to cover graffiti. So, oh my God, they, we we painted it a bright green, like a summery green. And the whole neighborhood blew up. People were coming to us. What color is that? What color is this? Yeah, and I still have that paint deck. And the whole neighborhood got painted. The whole neighborhood value increased so quickly; it was unbelievable. But so, is purchasing or is incentive zoning kind of like? buying properties that are below market value? I bought mine for like 
fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay. Well, and then you fix it up, and then you create. Right. You around. create the community. What the goal is is to bring that community around. When Jim and I first moved here, Gulfport was in Gulfport downtown was an incentive zone. And Jim and I were looking at that going, God, I wish we weren't so burnt out. We were so burnt out when we got here from real estate. If we weren't so burnt out, we would have bought something down there. And we should just drive by and we'd go, I smell money here. <laughs> <laughs> right? And do you guys remember right after Katrina, what did downtown Gulfport look like? That was an incentive zone. What's it look like now? Yeah. How quick did those properties increase in value? It's been about 15 years. So. Yeah, they were, yeah, the original, sure, yeah, were the original people flipped? Lot. The original yeah. people probably flipped them. Yeah. yeah, probably about five years. The original people probably started flipping them out. Okay, so so yeah, it, it's um, incentive zonings. You guys have a ton of incentive zonings here in Mississippi. It blows my mind how many you have. And I have a map up here, I'll show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a student run down at lunchtime and buy a lot in the incentive zone <laughs> next to me. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Okay. Buffer zone, what's a buffer zone? A buffer zone is an area that's going to separate two distinct areas. Okay, so on the exam, they're gonna talk about a mall. This is gonna have the mall here. They're gonna have garden homes here. And then beside the garden homes on the other side, they're going to have single family residences. Okay, what is the garden homes doing between the, where all the kids live in the mall? What's it doing? Buffering. Buffering. It's keeping the kids out where all the transients and stuff hang out at the mall, right? I can tell you, even like, I'm looking around when I'm leaving here, you know, and this is, you know, I mean, I wonder. Uh, I yell at more people in this parking lot, oh my God. Um, this is going to be a paper of the homeless community that says, don't talk to her. <laughs> I don't know you! <laughs> I always yell at him. <laughs> anyway, it's really sad. And, I, and I, I feel bad, but it's like, I don't like him. Okay. Um, <laughs> so anyway, what is, they're going to ask you, they're going to ask you on the exam, what's the best example of a buffer zone? And your answer is going to be the garden homes between the mall and the single family residences. People who buy garden homes are either people just starting out or people retiring. There's very few kids in townhomes, right? What, and what are the walls called out back? Oh, who's Bob. responsible if Bob lives on one side and he wants to paint it, who's responsible to paint that? Uh, no, I what happens if the party wall falls down? Oh, you guys are getting this. Excellent. All right, so watch that, that party wall. Party wall. Party wall. Party wall. Okay. Usually we have a buffer zone sometimes in agricultural rivers around uh, rivers to save, in that case, the Salmon River. Um, they, they will leave the natural habitat around the, the farming because they don't want the farming chemicals or fertilizer to run into the river and kill the fish. Okay, down zoning, we talked about that. That's when you bring it into a less dense population. I loved it. I was buying a duplex in a neighborhood or two cottages in a neighborhood that only people can build single family residences in. How cool was that? Right? That was cool. That was my first property I ever bought. And I was making $8 an hour when I bought my first property. Think about that. And as, as, we'll, as, we'll, as we go through the scores, we'll talk about how we did it. All right. Anybody can buy real estate if they at least keep their credit to a decent level. All right, then we'll talk about how to do that. Okay, so setback, here's part of your zoning setback. How far from the side of your lot zone can you build? How far from the street? How far from your backyard? 10 feet easements usually. 15, some of the zero lot lines in the city. You know, you're right on the lot line. You know, so it's, it's all over the place. So what are the building codes also for the building itself, which is the police power because it's protecting you. They don't want the building to fall down on you. It's your standards for construction. Standards for construction. Here's another police power, eminent domain. Eminent domain is when the government takes your property 
because it's going to better the neighborhood, better the community. Like, um, when I first met my husband, Jim, one of his friends became one of my largest clients. And the guy's name, he's dead, so I'll give you his real name. Call him a name, actually. Dan Brown was his name. Excellent. He was a real estate broker. Why did he use me? Because he didn't know anything about apartment complexes. He was a high-rise broker. So he specialized in high-rises all across the country. And then he also was one of the guys that started that concept where um, he would buy, he would rent for years one entire floor in a high-rise. And when you got out of the elevator, there was a shared secretary. And around the perimeter of the building were all like one desk offices. And then there would be like a conference room. Anybody ever see that concept? Okay. So he did a lot of those too. He was um, the quintessential self-made millionaire. He also, he started with an insurance company. Who's, who's had an insurance company? You're going to keep that too? Probably. Yeah, he started with an insurance company and then got his real estate broker's license. So he had two. At the point that I met him, his stepson took over his insurance company. Um, he didn't know about apartment complexes, so he hired me. When I sell my house, my residential house, I have to hire one of you. I have to hire a real estate agent that I know that I'm not legally tied into because I have no idea how to sell a house. People hate me when they come. They do. I'm, I yell at them. You know? <laughs> if they don't like the paint color, I start insulting them. Who cares? Paint! <laughs> 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 you know, I just I just don't get it. I'm like the worst. I am like the worst residential salesperson. I yell at people. People I, mean, I don't I won't even try it. Um so I have to hire you guys. So that's another test question. Stay within your area of competence. All right, stay within your area of competence. Don't start trying to think you're gonna do co commercial real estate and you've never ventured in it yourself or you've never been involved in it yourself. Because I get a lot of first-year agents who say, I want to do commercial. I go, well, I guess you can draw upon your house first. I don't own a house. I'm like, start with your house and then go into the house, which is good. Okay, residential is a great foundation. And then build on that. Don't stop there. Okay? But start looking into it and researching it. And research for yourself because there's a lot of bad advice out there. And I want you guys to get your advice and make your conclusions. All right. Okay, so Dan Brown was really interesting. He also, this guy had so many sources of income. He was, when you read all these millionaire self books, you find out that true millionaires have several sources of income. You do not get wealthy by having a job nine to five. I can't tell you how many doctors are dirt poor when they hit 70. They spent all their money, they have no other income. What was that? Debt. Debt. They, they overextend themselves because they're making so much at that time. I can't tell you how many have come in here saying, I need a new career. I can't pay my house payment anymore. Don't put your eggs in one basket. Don't put your eggs in one basket. Okay? That's why I'm going to keep stressing to you guys to, to get some type of passive income. All right? Take care of yourself. I don't want to see another broker that's been in the business for 30 or 40 years come in here and say, I make so many people wealthy. And I got great commissions, but I never took care of myself. I can't retire. All right, I want you guys to start thinking about yourself. Okay, so anyways, Dan Brown was, was awesome like that. You also, when you start reading about all these people that can say, and say most of them did it in real estate. Okay, and when the market goes down, you're making money, and I'm telling you. Okay, so whenever I see an eminent domain, I think of Dan Brown, because he was... He was he was amazing at this, this real estate concept called anticipation, which is on the test. Okay, So anticipation is making a decision based on some future event. And he did one with them in a domain. There was a point when I first met him that he was talking about um, the, how the freeway up by Pasadena and Glendale area where the three freeways converged. It was like the 2, the 10, and the 210. And they wanted to build a high-rise elevated freeway interchange in a neighborhood. So the city and the county went around. They bought, they eminent domain all these houses. And when they take your house, what they do is they condemn your house and they pay you just compensation. So they took all these houses, and right where all the interest, where the freeways intercepted in the center, 
they didn't need that property because they didn't need the airspace to, to drive over and they didn't need to put a pillow there. They did not have eminent domain that one guy's house. It was right in the center. And he was screaming and yelling, saying, I can't, I'm the only house left here. Everything's being torn down. My house isn't worth whatever. And it was this old guy. And eventually it was on one of those TV stations. You guys ever see those human, uh, human stories, like two on your side or four on your side? Will they go and interview somebody who can't get their word across to the government or to somebody? He was on one of those and Dan Brown saw it. Dan Brown knocked on that guy's door. And he offered him more money than anybody in the neighborhood got. So, and that was so interesting about Dan Brown. Whenever he's done a transaction, no one ever felt like they got ripped off. It was amazing. And so he offered the guy more money and the guy took it. Dan Brown sat on that house until the freeway was done. It took about seven years for that freeway to be, to be done. It was our party house. That's when we went and like had like, hellacious parties because we couldn't get in trouble mm -hmm. <laughs> nobody was there <laughs> I mean we had bands and everything I mean it was like awesome nobody was there to get pissed off it was awesome um but anyways when the freeway when the freeway was built he painted it was a little uh post uh, world war ii house it was like three bedrooms one bath everybody ever see those little houses like that he painted it pink and he just did like minimal repair so it was safe and everything worked, painted it pink was in the middle of all these freeways up above him, this side, this side, and this side. He bought elevated billboards like this that faced the freeway so you could see stuff coming and going in each direction and advertised his insurance company. He had the best advertising space in Los Angeles County. His business went crazy. It was like this insurance company, next exit, no matter where they were, it was the next exit. And he ended up selling. <laughs> he ended up. He ended up buying it. I'll never forget. For like like two ten or two twenty, two hundred ten thousand, two hundred twenty thousand. He sold it for well over a million dollars. Well over a million dollars. And now it's funny because when I look at the property now, whoever he sold it to made millions of dollars on it as well because they sold it to a hospital. <laughs> no, a hospital there. And just think about it, that poor guy was like, "Get me out of this. I'll take two hundred thousand dollars." Okay. So whenever I think of eminent domain, I think of reverse condemnation is what that guy was trying to do. Okay. It wasn't pure eminent domain. The government wasn't taking his property, but he was trying to force the government to take his property. It's called reverse condemnation. Only the property owner can file or attempt reverse condemnation. On the exam, your reverse condemnation question is going to be, um, the expansion of an airport runway. They're gonna say an airport is extending their runway, so there was five houses on the street that they wanted to take. They took four and left that last one there. Now the people that live there are having noise issues and shaking issues every time a plane takes off. What could that guy wants out of his property? What could he file for? Reverse, Reverse condemnation. Okay. And your anticipation question that Dan Brown was amazing at. He did another thing that was just amazing to me with anticipation is he, he kept going, I bought another one. I'm like, when we see Jim, I'm like, what are you buying? He'd go, oh, this desert land. And he would, I'd go, let me see. And it'd be a picture of dirt. I'm out in the desert. <laughs> Not even true. So I was like, wow, that's, that's cool. You know, <laughs> what are you doing with that? You know, I didn't, I didn't want to question because he was like a big guy. Um, I mean, money-wise, big guy. And, and I was like, okay. You know, and I could never could figure out what happened. Again, like seven, eight years later, they extended the freeway and all the lots he bought were the exit ramps and he built gas stations. I mean, <laughs> the guy was amazing. Okay, so again, anticipation. Here's your anticipation question. A woman has decided not to sell her home because she just found out or just heard that a factory is bringing 5,000 jobs to her neighborhood. What is she basing her decision on? Anticipation. That's right. Only the federal and state and local government and some type of government entity are the only people that can do eminent domain. So knowing that, here's a question. Can a condo complex eminent domain three houses adjacent to their parking lot so they can extend their parking? Oh, wow. That's right. Excellent. That's right. Uh, okay, hold on. Let me get the volume up on this. Give me one second. Yeah. 
Where's my Why don't you just leave the laptop? Hold on. Why am I what? Why don't you just leave the laptop? Because that's where the sound comes out. Um, Welcome back. A Connecticut resident lost his home in a Supreme Court eminent domain room very famously. The city of New London used eminent domain to get that land, promising it would be redeveloped to create jobs and boost the economy. It's the Kilo case. But 10 years later, the land is just piles of rubble, boarded up houses, and a lot of empty lots. Michael Cristofaro is one of the homeowners. He joins us live. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, this is that very famous uh, New London versus Kilo case. Yes, it is. Where the Supreme Court said, yep, yeah, a, a town can take your property if it's in their, if, if it's in their best interest. Originally, Michael, what were they going to do with all of that property? Well, they were going to build a conference center, a fitness center, biotech buildings, a hotel, uh, which was supposed to complement the uh, Pfizer pharmaceutical plant that was being built. Okay, so that was their, uh, that was Leslie, we can't hear the video. Okay. <laughs> it's going to squeak, you guys. All right. I'm going to pull it back just a little. We missed the entire video. 1895, and they're saying, hey, listen, you guys weren't good enough to live here. We're going to wipe the area clean, turn around, and now here it is 10 years later. Uh, the best use for this land is to turn it into a neighborhood because the same suburbanites are moving back into the city, and they want something that's a walk into it to downtown sure. and everything Do you want to move back? If, if we could have our property back, I, I would. Uh, you want the city to give you the, the land Absolutely. back? Absolutely. For what we went through? Absolutely. I mean, it was our home. It was my father's you know, land. It was my father's home. Absolutely. It was, it was the ultimate land grab, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the U.S. Supreme Court made the wrong decision. I mean, look across the United States today. I mean, you know, New York has its seven of the major sure. problems. New Jersey does. California, the big cases going on out there. I mean, when they made that decision, it was a wrong decision. The floodgates are wide open, and we need to close those floodgates. Man, it really sounds like they blew it. Uh, Michael Cristofaro, we thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, great. Thank you so very much. What a story. Sorry you went through. Well, we, we need to do something. We do. All right. Thanks for telling your story. I don't know how to stop that squeaking, you guys. We're trying everything here. Hold on. <clears throat> Testing. Turn the volume on too. You guys, can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 I hear you. Uh, can't hear the video though. Uh. So, quick question. Right. Oh, there it goes. Well, that was <laughs> no, you guys, I'll, I can play that after class again for you guys online. 
when you're ready. It's about, uh, it's called Kilo versus New London, Connecticut. And it's a very famous eminent domain case where it went to the Supreme Court on if the city of New London could do what they did. And what they did was, you know, who can only have a domain? Okay, for the betterment of the people, like the freeway, right? Like the freeway, you want traffic to flow easier. The city of New London, Connecticut was trying to eminent domain that neighborhood so that the Pfizer pharmaceutical company could build their factory. <clears throat> so they were trying to eminent domain, not for the betterment of the people, but yeah, somebody got paid. But basically, so a company can, can build a business there, and then they were saying it would bring jobs yeah. and give us a higher tax base than the neighborhood that was there. So a really thin line on was New London, Connecticut legal doing that. And it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, they are, they can do it. And so New London did it, but what happened when that Supreme Court came down was neighborhoods, Older neighborhoods all across this country started getting eminent domain by cities, especially little oceanfront communities. Entire neighborhoods were being eminent domain, houses were being torn down, so a developer who had plans could come in and build a, build a uh, hotel, or build a spa, or build this, or build that. And nobody built anything. And all these neighborhoods, all these neighbors, it was all prime real estate where, yeah, they were older homes, older communities, but you could not duplicate that oceanfront neighborhood for the same price that of the house that they were in that was given to them for three generations. And so these people never felt like they got enough money. Location, 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 location. location. What's that called? Yes. Yeah. Woo. Situs. S-I-T-U-S. Yeah. Area location. Perfect. Area preference. Nice. Okay, um, so that's what happened, and it caused a bunch of problems all over the country. Does anybody know of eminent domain around here that happened? That you ready to talk? That was a question I was going to ask. My mom and dad had a waterfront property in Biloxi. Um, my grandpa and grandma lived right next door. They were run out of the by the city. Eminent domain took over for industrial purposes, and it could only be used for industrial purposes. Right now, a casino sits on top of it. Now, they immediately used it for industrial purposes, but then they sold it off or leased it out. Was it right around 2004, 2003? 1967. Wow, way before. Okay, all right. And now the old Margaritaville that never made it sits on their property. And wow. multiple aspects of our family was run out of there. And so if they took eminent domain back then, for the aspect of industrial, and now they've decided to change that, let a casino come in, does that default the eminent domain? Where's that ball? <laughs> <laughs> I would have to go throw this out at an attorney and ask them, because I don't know what the condition of the original eminent domain paperwork was. You know, I would have to like read all the paperwork and go back that long, and, and that's an excellent question, does it? Because okay. I know that um, some people, some Remember water rights? What is the water right that is granted by the government? Prior appropriation, right? I know of developers who came in and they put in farms that grew sprouts because sprouts need more water than the average crop. And so they got prior appropriation with the intention after they, without telling anybody, when they had prior appropriation for a few years, they tear down the farms and they had water, so they built communities. So that would be like the same concept of the eminent domain. Did I see you up over here? You know the shed barbecue? Uh huh. They took a portion, so the original building was close to the road. And I don't know what they took a portion for on eminent domain. I don't know if it was a, a water facility or maybe they extended the road, but they took a portion and then the shed, the first building burned down like, like a month after the agreement. Ooh, a lot of fires going on in these cases, yeah. I've noticed. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All in Texas, five miles on crackhead. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you, you said it all takes is five dollars on a crackhead. Yeah. <laughs> it just moved them back. Yeah, it's yeah. just a little coincidental. We have insurance guy here. You want to 
I do life insurance. You do. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I heard. So I'm not. It's just life insurance. They literally got moved back. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's interesting story. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah, so uh, it, there's so many lawsuits as you can see in real estate, with eminent domain and, and all that stuff. So, so read your paperwork. Read your paperwork. Okay. okay. E&O insurance yes. with eminent domain. Yeah, like a real estate agent usually unless they're hired by the owner of the property is usually not involved and not a party to the eminent uh, domain proceedings because it would be from the government organization to the owner of the property. Yeah, no, in fact, we, thank you, Terry, for bringing that up. She's saying, so what if you sell a property and then a month later they come in and say, sorry, we're eminent domaining your property. Okay. You go, if you know of an eminent domain property that you may be listing or some type of change in zoning or anything on that property, you have to disclose it. So you disclose that up front. Leslie. You don't know, you don't know. That's right. You're not responsible for things you don't know. That's right. Yes. What is it still anticipation if you own land and you hear that something bad is going to come to the area? So you dump your land? What is that terminology? Um, <laughs> well, anybody want to take a guess at that? I would just say protecting your interest, but you still have to disclose anything you know to the buyer. I was thinking as myself as the homeowner, like if I knew that something yucky was going to be by me, so I hurriedly sold. Okay. I just wondered if that's considered anticipation also. Well, you're going to have to disclose that to the buyer. Do you have to disclose a rumor? Like if you've heard a rumor that it is, but there's no documentation that's going to take place? Do you, and you have? It? There's been a lawsuit of that recently. I forget exactly what it was, but it was a rumor. Yeah. Somebody heard a rumor that something was going to happen and told their buyer, and then they, it was in the paper that something was going to happen. And the agent told the buyer, look, look what's going to happen. Do they know look what's going to happen? And the buyer bought, and then the, the project got canceled. So I know that there was a lawsuit against an agent somewhere in the area that, that ran across that. But as far as you selling for, um, uh, because you think something bad is going to happen, I don't know if there's a real term for that. Um, but I know if you know about something, you're going to have to disclose it. And as far as a rumor, that, that's such a gray area. You know, I may say there's a rumor, but I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, throw that ball. You know, why don't you do some research? Like I tell you guys, why don't you go do some research and you come back tomorrow and tell me. You know, but don't say something's going to happen. Look, look what's going to happen. Right? So just be careful of that. Okay. I, I'm sorry, I wish I could help you a little bit more. If you say it's going to rain, show me the forecast. If you show me it's going to rain, show me the forecast. Yeah, that's true. Things can change all the time. <laughs> okay, inverse condemnation. We talked about reverse condemnation. Who's the only one that can do reverse condemnation? Homeowner. That's right. Inverse condemnation, only the, home, the landowner can do it also. It's when they don't think they got enough money. Okay, so they're gonna sue. I want more money. The just compensation was not just. And you see a lot of those go on. They normally pay you just a little bit above market value, don't they? Um, they only pay you a little bit above market value. <sighs> yeah, about five years. Thank you for that question. It's an excellent question. Okay, or excellent statement. Um, the only paperwork I saw on a reverse condemnation was when a friend of mine just asked me with no legal responsibility to just find out why, how they were basing their decision on because she wanted to do an inverse condemnation. She wanted to sue them because it wasn't enough money. And her neighbors volunteered their tax bills as long with hers, and I sat down with her. And what we realized was the city gave them 3% over what their assessed value was. Anybody know what an assessed value is? What appraisal, it's, not because it's an actual selling area? No. No. It's what they base your taxes on. You're going to be paying your ad volarum taxes. What ad volarum means? 
AV, according to value, add ballroom taxes on. And who's looked at their tax value? It's very low. It's very low. It's very low, but you want to keep it low because you don't want to pay a lot of taxes. It's sometimes less than half the property value. Double-edged sword. Yeah, so it's a double-edged sword. If you're going to be eminent domain on, it can come back and hurt you. All right, so. But generally, would they do an appraisal first and then sell off of that? Generally, will they do an appraisal? In, their, in the case that I know about, they just went by the tax records. Okay, so tax records. Okay. Yeah, but it, 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 again, it's going to be buried everywhere. All right, so all right, so that's your inverse confirmation. Thank you for that. Okay, taxation. What is taxation for? It's your charge on real estate. What are taxes used for? Meet the demands of the government. Excellent. And there's your ad volorum. That's what your taxes are going to be based on. Is your assessed value ad volorum according to value? That is your property taxes. How many times a year do you pay it? Once. Once. President, I, I got a quick question to see if you can answer this. Okay. I know I have a lot, but oh no, that's good. I have property that is going. I bought. It's going to be a subdivision. Okay. I wanted to build on it, okay. but the city said, "Well, we haven't cut a road through yet." Okay. So I said, "Cut one." They said, "Well, we're not planning that for the next two to three years." I said, "Then why are you charging me taxes on that property when you're not giving me anything in return?" And they're refusing to cut the road through. All right. Do I have any stand on that or be paying taxes? Somebody throw him a ball. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. In our area, North Mississippi, the developer has to build the street themselves. And then if they want the city or the county to upkeep it, they have to deed it over to the city or the county for them to upkeep it. But you initially have to build it yourself if you're the developer. I agree. According to Central Mississippi, also, our uh, development authorities have any subdivision is, is produced by the developer. They must put the in for the infrastructure, including those streets and water and gas and everything else, and then it's turned over. Do your do your new home communities have special assessments when they, when you, the buyers go to buy them? Ours don't. Ours don't because a lot of times they'll pass that on to the people that are going to be benefiting the street costs and stuff. We'll say there's a special assessment above. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for that. Do you know anybody no, living in a new home community? Do you have a special assessment on your taxes? No, not me. Oh, no, she's right behind you. You don't know. Uh, as far as I'm aware, this is. POA? Okay. I love Mississippi. I gotta tell you, I'm yeah. buying stuff. I, I don't, as far as I know, this is not a developer-owned situation. It's okay. a city-owned situation okay. that they're going to. They've already just parceled the lots sure. and are just going to cut the roads through. Sure. All sorts of stuff, guys. I don't know. See, I'm just like so excited. There's so much going on in the state. It's just amazing. Whether I'm up at Oxford or South Haven, the population is going crazy. The roads aren't big enough in Oxford. It's unbelievable. Then you come down here, and I never had a way to take a left turn before or to wait to take a right turn before. Anybody noticing the traffic getting really bad? Yes. Ask your real estate agents, what's the percentage of out-of-state buyers coming down to Mississippi to buy? A lot. It's huge. Who has neighbors that aren't from here that just moved in the last five years? Yeah. Look at that. What do you think is happening to the population here? It's increasing. People, my, my little secret of Mississippi is, is getting out. That's what I called it, my secret. <laughs> All right. So, guys, what happens when you have a lot of people move to an area? Hello. Yeah. That's right. Supply and demand. Can the can the developers keep up with the demand? Yeah. Yeah, before they even put a slab, you said it's already sold. Yeah, before they put a slab, already sold. Yeah, Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, for them. For us, <laughs> for anybody that owns around there, it's beautiful. Yeah. They're sold. Sold. There's nothing. Okay, go on. 
beach is exploding? Oh, yeah. That's all? It's crazy. Diamond Head? Diamond Head? That's all? Yep. 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 Amazing. How about Central Mississippi? I know you're up there by what, Jackson? Anyone want to share from online? In our area, the price of houses, they're just astronomical compared to what they've been in years past. I mean, you, you can't afford, you can't find just an inexpensive house anymore. I've flipped houses and it's really hard to find a house to flip anymore because they're so much more expensive than they have been in years past. Right, thank you. <laughs> they want to know where you are, where you flip, uh, just a general area. Oh, I'm in northeast Mississippi in a town called Pontotoc, which is between Tupelo and Oxford. Killing it up there. Oh, my God. We have classes in Oxford if you want to show up at those classes. An excellent instructor up there. I want to sometime. Thanks. The address is online. If you call here, we can give it to you. I think they start... Um, Next month. All right, if you want to go up there, she's excellent. Okay. Yeah, that's great. You guys are, are killing it up there as well. Oxford's just, when I first went there again, I mean, it was just amazing. Now your communities, everything built around our school. It was, it was just like fields with boxes running around them. You know? <laughs> and now it's like a golf course and then, you know, gorgeous homes. Okay. So, anyways, what's that tell you? I'm buying shit. <laughs> okay, so Columbus, Columbus, looking awesome. You guys getting excited? Yeah, good. Okay, as cheap. This is my favorite word in real estate. If somebody dies without a will, and the state comes in. And they're going to seize the property and say, okay, where are their ears? Where are their kids? Where are their brothers? Where are their nieces? Where are their nephews? If the state can't find anybody that person is related to, to give all his property to, everything is cheap to the state. Is there a certain time limit on that? I don't know. It's probably, I'm going to guess. <laughs> It's, it's probably state specific, but I, I don't know. I, I would definitely check into it if I was more concerned about it. Okay, so it is cheats to the state. What's that? What what, what word is in there? Cheat. Cheat. The cheating out of your property. Okay. Cheat. Cheat. Mm -hmm. It's weird to me for some reason. Okay. Regular special land types. Right, why don't you guys take 10 minutes? I've been going all morning. Oh, you guys know? All right, let's go. All right, good. Okay. Floodplain. What's a floodplain? Anybody live in a floodplain? We're talking about floodplains yesterday, right? Okay. Land adjacent to a stream, it's occasional flooding as opposed to wetlands. Here's your wetlands question. What type of real estate is set aside for conservation? Wetlands. There you go, wetlands. And you have NOAA, you're well of that. National Flood Insurance Program, you need to know it was created by Congress. Okay, you guys probably all aware of it. Okay, um, you guys are really good on this, these FEMA pro questions on the test. Yeah. <laughs> FEMA flood map service. Okay, I was surprised that some agents didn't know this existed. And they called me up. They go, they want to know if it, this property is in a floodplain. I was like, it's right, right online. Okay, you can put any address online there at FEMA, and it will show you where it is in regards to a floodplain. Okay, so that's going to be one of your resources you're going to be using in the real world. All right, so your flood. You are here. We moved down the street. Um, we were here, but we moved out to here. We are now in a flood zone, and okay, we weren't before. All right, so that, that you can actually show your clients or your customers, whoever. Okay, regulations on environmental hazards. Here's your pollution. Formaldehyde, colorless flammable gas. You guys, your FEMA trailers had a problem with formaldehyde, right? It could cause uh, high exposure. It can cause cancers. I know that um, I had a, a client not from the United States that he was horrified that there was formaldehyde in carpeting or carpeting glue. 
And he would, everything he looked at, nothing could be carpeted around him. He was scared to death of carpet. In your clothes. In your clothes, yeah, wow, okay. Um, they use it for composite wood, which is gonna be your trailers, mostly in hardwood, particle wood, fiber wood, materials for building, insulation, fertilized pesticides. It's all over the place, formaldehyde. Lead, there is lead-based paint is another hazard. Lead-based paint has a national law that says if you buy a house built before 1978, your buyer has 10 days to inspect that property. And if they decide they don't like it, even though you had an accepted offer, they can back out. All right, that's your lead-based paint. Disclosure, if you buy a property between that, the seller needs to disclose to the buyer or the tenant that there's potentially high levels or levels or any type of level of, of lead-based paint. The seller does not have to remove it. Okay, you're definitely gonna be asked this year. 1978, before 1978. The buyer has 10 days to inspect the property for lead-based paint. They have to acknowledge that it could possibly be there, the seller does not have to remove it. Okay, radon gas. Here's another hazard. You guys aren't too bad on radon gas in this area. Odorless, colorless, radioactive gas may cause lung cancer. It's the number one leading cause of lung cancer among non-smokers. The number two leading cause of lung cancer among smokers and non-smokers. When you measure for radon, you can go up to the third floor. Can everybody hold up three fingers for me? On the PSI exam, if you see three as one of your answers, chances are or a high probability that that's gonna be your correct answer. All right, third floor, how long do you keep your copies in real estate? Three years. How long do you have to, uh, when we get to the state, change your mind, three, three days. Okay, they, so, so it's three, three copies, three days, whatever. If you see three, chances are that's gonna be your answer. Okay, it also is easily mitigated. It enters your house through the basement. Oh. All right, I'm gonna skip that because I don't want that high pitch. It's a video of a guy that has radon mitigation in his basement. And basically what they do is they uh, drill a hole in your foundation in your basement and then they, uh, on one of the adjacent wall, wall farther away, they'll drill another hole. And then they put in a suction tube and they connect the tube to a pipe that puts all the radon outside your house. Okay, so radon is easily mitigated. That's gonna be one of your term, one of your questions. It's easily mitigated. It always, it's always been less than $2,000 when we've done it. So it's not even considered a big deal. All right, and you can measure it up to the third floor, okay? That's another one of your threes, okay? And this is not on the test, but people usually ask me where high levels of radon are. The pink levels have the higher levels. Huh? Because it's because of the geography. Radon is radioactive gas coming from, I always like to say dinosaurs or whatever's in the ground from before. Okay, so that's where it's gonna come. Those are. Coming from, China. coming from China. <laughs> That's the drywall. And it doesn't last. They ship it on American flags. They ship <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, that map on radon is not on your um, not on your 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 test. But anyways, you also have a guide to radon, just like lead-based paint. You, you, people have to acknowledge that there could be radon on the property. You want to hand this to you, the buyer or the tenant. Asbestos, this area is like the asbestos capital. I was like horrified how much asbestos you guys use here. Seriously, you guys have it all over the place. Okay, it's a mineral fiber. It, it comes from rock and soil. And you guys have asbestos tiles on a lot of your older homes here. And you guys have asbestos flooring on a lot of your older homes here. Do not try to remove it. If you start removing asbestos tile or asbestos flooring, particles, yeah, you, activate it, really. you activate it. That's what you do. You activate the particles that go into the air. 
Yep, mm -hmm. and they, those fibers get lodged in your lungs, and you can get mesothelioma. Did you guys see those mesothelioma mm -hmm. it's like commercials? It's like inhaling insulation. It's like inhaling insulation, right? Yeah, you don't want to do that. It was used because it was a good flame retardant and water repellent. Okay, so those were the asbestos tiles look like. You guys know any homes that look like that tiling? They're everywhere. They're everywhere. I could, I mean, I, I've come across Southern California, but not like you guys here. You guys, you have street upon street upon street. It's amazing. All right, so basically, to handle asbestos, what you're going to do is encapsulate it. That's going to be one of your test questions. Encapsulate it. Okay, and what that does, oh, paint it, basically, is what you do. When my client, uh, Sean, he said I can use his name, um, bought a house with asbestos siding, the first thing he did was had it painted. He encapsulate, encapsulated the asbestos so it can't escape. So best way to treat asbestos is to encapsulate it. Is radon easily mitigated? Yes. There you go. Nice job. The next one is UFF or UFFI. They might spell it out, urea formaldehyde foam insulation. It was the key word here, pumped. There's going to be only one question on your test that uses the word pumped. And this is it. This was pumped between the walls. This is also banned. This was also banned. PCBs, polychlorinated biphenols. This was from electrical products. And if you want to, at some point, go home and read about the Hudson River and General Electric, how they, they basically killed a river. And it's, it's going to take 100 or 200 years to clean it up. Huh? Did they have a TV program about it? It's horrifying. That's the next Taylor. Taylor. Taylor just asked a great question. She said, uh, are these things that a home inspector is going to look for or is that separate? Your home inspector most likely is going to look for that. On your sellers, when, you, when your seller lists the property, you're going to get a um, property condition disclosure statement. And the seller needs to fill it out. And on that disclosure statement, it's going to ask, are there any PCBs? Are there any this or are there any that? So if your seller knows about it, they have to disclose it. And you as an agent, if you know about it, you have to make sure it's disclosed. All right. But if you don't know, you don't know. Again, you're not responsible for things you don't know. Okay. So there's your New York PCB. They're still cleaning it up. It flows right into New York Harbor. Don't eat the fish, okay? There's a lot of PCBs still in effect right now. That's what they look like. You guys see this, these all over the place, right? Transformers. Okay, so those are everywhere. Waste disposal sites. This is responsible for a lot of damage. Erin uh, Brockovich had to do with the waste disposal site. Um, a waste disposal site, if it's put on the wrong type of soil, will pollute the groundwater, and that's what happened in her case. All the kids were just dying and getting cancers and just horrible. All the toxins that were being dumped got into the drinking water. Okay, so they have to be on special uh, soil. Okay, underground storage tanks, they're going to call, call them UST, U-S-T. If they're leaking, they're going to call it LUST, L-U-S-T, leaking. And I'm going to say something that a student told me. It wasn't me. It was a 65-year-old woman that told me she will never forget that lust is leaking because they shouldn't be in the same sentence. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Some people got it. Okay, but that was not me. <laughs> That's what she said. I couldn't believe it. She was like, old. <laughs> I was like, whoa. She, yeah, I know. She was leaking lust. You know what she was? Oh, oh my God. I, and I'm going to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you her name. She's still around. She, she, and she, she calls me every so often and still says, she said, kick on, you know how like on your application, you have to disclose anything you got in trouble for? She had it disclosed. She got arrested for skinny dipping. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she was, she was a lot of fun. <laughs> okay. So underground storage tank. If you're selling a gas station, it has a leaking underground storage tank. It needs to be removed. That's one of your government regulations. 
Okay, if you have a buyer who wants to buy a house next to a gas station, what should you suggest he do? It's cl you're close. It's going to be your. It's going to be a soil sample. Yeah, that's so what so I get tested. Yeah, get the soil. Just like when you want to build a house and you want to test the soil on the land. Right. That's right. Right. Okay, but they're going to give you the example of next door to a gas station. Okay. Ground how? How are sources of groundwater contamination? They come from everywhere. Runoff, seepage, all sorts of stuff. Fertilizers. Groundwater. Okay, speaking of groundwater or drinking water, is your water company a nonprofit? Absolutely. Your answer is going to be yes. What? Yep. On the test, they're going to ask you, they're going to talk about a, a water company for a city or a county, and they're going to ask you if it's a nonprofit. Well, how is it a nonprofit? What was that? How is it a nonprofit? I don't know. <laughs> do, do, you know, do you know how a nonprofit actually works? They make sure everyone gets paid. At, at the end of the year, you just can't show a that you profit. made money the bottom line. So everybody just bonuses out at the end of the year. Just like goodwill. Perfect statement. That's all it is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, so they do ask that question. And again, um, the, a lot of people, sub buyers, I guess, are gonna ask what's the water quality like, what's the beach water quality like. Again, you can go to the EPA and just put in an address. They'll tell you all the water qualities in a particular neighborhood. Okay, another uh, hazard in real estate is EMFs, electronic magnetic fields. You see those in gross easements that have those electrical things, those electrical wires. I know that there's some developers that won't build within a certain range of those, a certain amount of feet of those, because you can get EMF readers and walk around and see what's going on. Okay, what are EMFs caused by? It was one of your questions. It's going to be circulating electrical currents, and it's suspected of causing cancer. 5G. I know, 5G. Um, sources, is all sources of EMFs. TV screens, house alarms. I hate this thing near my head because it has EMFs going off right now. Right? I talk on my phone like this. So I they come. You, you look immune, though. I'm, I'm immune? <laughs> <laughs> I already had it. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't escape those, evidently. Okay, mold. Mold may cause allergic reactions, but there's one mold that will kill you. Black mold. black mold. The technical term for black mold is Stachy Botrys chartarum. I know. How can you how can you get that answer wrong? Last name. Oh, really? What's your last name? No. <laughs> Stachy Botrys chartarum. And Okay. Regulation of environmental hazards. Okay, the house eventually got torn down to a beautiful area of Texas, too. Okay, circular. This is your very first environmental legislation. They may call it circular, C E R C L A, or they may spell it out for you Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. It's also known as Superfund, because what it did was it created the Superfund, it created a $9 billion fund to help properties be cleaned up. It held the polluting party responsible for the cleanup. And then they also decided that later on that it can be the person who polluted, the president of the company can be solely responsible plus the company individually or as a group can be held responsible. All right, so whoever made the decision plus the company there's two, uh, there's two cases that happened that Circular was in response to. That's called Valley of the Drums, if you ever want to look up that up. Louisville, Kentucky. And then the Love Canal, which uh, William T. Love was building a community that got abandoned. And uh, a, uh, a chemical company dumped a bunch of chemicals in the big hole that the original person built. And kids were like swimming in it because it filled up with water in the summer. 
and then they built a bunch of houses on it and they put a school on it because it was in section one 16. 16 and all the kids at that elementary school uh there's a video of this guy kid that went there his name's michael that um talked about having a high school reunion and he found all the kids that went to the it's called the 19th street school and he said every one of my friends including me have they either died or they have some type of chronic illness from that school. Okay, so super fun. I know, isn't that super fun? All right, so just be careful. Okay, super fun uh, development. Okay, super fun. What's a super fun? All right, so that's your super fun. That's Mississippi phosphates. There, that's, they're not gonna ask you exactly about Mississippi phosphates, that's just an example. Okay, the next legislation was SARA, S-A-R-A, SARA. Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act. It came after the first one, CERCLA. And what this one did, it established stronger cleanup standards, and they also had a fund now for innocent landowners. And it gave innocent landowners immunity for the cost of cleaning it up or the responsibility of cleaning it up. So what happened when, when an innocent person, the person who did not pollute the property, finds himself in possession of a polluted property, the government would help them clean it up. Okay, but it is still the seller's responsibility before the property transfers. Okay, Brownfields was next. Brownfields Revitalization and Environmental Restoration Act. It helps rejuvenate deserted, defunct, and derelict, toxic industrial waste sites. Okay, that's gonna be in Brownfields. And it has restrictions, this is what gives you the restrictions on sale and development of contaminated property. You're not gonna be able to build a, a, a property where kids live on it. Okay, so here's just, um, just since 2019, if you wanna look this up, the EPA, three communities in Mississippi, we're giving some grants to clean up their neighborhoods. You guys, this stuff is like right in your own backyard. All right. So what's going to happen is your clients, your buyers are going to say, is it near a dump? Is it near here? Is it near there? You're going to need to know what's in your area. Okay. So the birth of super fund again is the uh, Love Canal area where um, it was in upstate New York by Niagara Fall. Here was the activist that fought the development and fought the government to make the government buy out that entire neighborhood. They bought 5,000 homes because all those people were being affected in that community from the Love Canal. 56% of our children were born with birth defects from that upstate New York. She's still active today. Here's 2018. I love it. It's become a uh, revitalization zone. Anybody want a house lot cheap and build a nice house on Love Canal? Mm -hmm. They started marketing them uh, to older people see if they wanted to build some homes on it. Is that crazy? Okay, so anyways, you can look up your, your property again at the EPA, do your address, see what's around you. All right, you never know, you never know what's around you. Okay, we talked about government issues. Let's talk about uh, private controls. D conditions. Anybody live in a homeowners association? Yes. Yeah. Do you like it? No. It's good or bad. Yeah, it's good or bad. Yeah. I don't use that. That's right. That's a test question. <laughs> right. I had to call on like they were sending me pictures of my neighbor's cars <laughs> telling me that I shouldn't be parking in front of my own house. Oh man. I said if y'all send me anything and I literally stopped I stopped paying. I just, yeah. I was constantly every day they're running around in their cars taking pictures. And they're not doing any improvement to anything. Out of state company took over the neighborhood. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Yeah, homeowners association. The only exam they're going to ask what's the reasoning for a homeowner association? You already said it. 
Maintain the value of the property. Maintain the value of the property. Use the microphone. They bought off the roof. They actually created a POA while we were in the house. You know, we never had one. Now they created a POA. Oh, okay. So it's good. Wind dance. Right. So your association so now, became another association, or you never had an association? Never had one and now we are. Did your Did you look at your original paperwork stating that at some point you will have one? No. Because it's not done. You sure? Wow. Wow. You bought them all, okay. Yeah, All right. All right, so they created a, a homeowner association after she bought it. After we bought I had a, a, a client that beat one of those. Because it was never in any of her documents and writing anywhere. The house is built on 50 degrees uh -huh. in the subdivision. It was the same thing. I came in right before they, it was like five or six houses. Now it's like huge subdivisions. Right. Yeah. And that's what it did. So and now they want to charge, they want to charge you. What are you saying? Is he moved you, in? Are they like you? No, uh, D, uh, DSLD. DSLD, yeah. Yep. They're on the other side. So yep. they built Abbott's office, the first one on the floor. We got it, and then DSL bought on whoever the second yeah. See now it's so big, like they're taking over from the railroad track all the way down. Yeah. That new gas station on 53. Yeah. Homeowners associations. It's really interesting. You guys need to look at your paperwork because about about eight years ago, I was screaming because there was this legislation passed on behalf of homeowners association called the Super Priority Lean or the Super Lean Priority Law. And it was established by the management of homeowners association where they can now write in their documents that they take first precedent over your mortgage, your first yeah. mortgage, they and they can foreclose on your house. They can foreclose on your house yeah, they yeah. Told me they're gonna put for your unpaid balance. Yeah. Said, and ahead. then that loan, your mo it's, it's happening. I wouldn't play with that. We have a video of what of some people that played with that. Yeah. And they took their house. For, and there's a, a house, I'm going to show you a video, I'll get the sound right, of a woman who had a $450,000 house. The Homeowners Association took it and sold it for like $30,000 right from under her. Because that's what she owed? Yeah, that's what she owed. And she had, and they, they evicted her and the guy moved in. The guy owns it. And they mortgage, it's called the Super Priority Lean Law. And I'll never, I was like, why isn't anybody fighting this? I don't know what's going on. And uh, it passed. You guys might want to look it up. Look at Las Vegas to the party lean law. That's the best example that I have. It's amazing what happened to that lunch. Yeah, I wouldn't mess around with that. All right. Um, restrictive covenants, deed restrictions. This is a limitation on use. It's going to tell you what you can do and what you can't do on your property. Do you get extra paperwork? Um, when you buy in a homeowners association at the close of escrow like or I'm before the close of escrow. I feel like I'm renting my own house. Like a property management company is coming in and telling me what I need. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's not even like acceptable anymore. I don't live in a homeowners association. You, yeah. Well, I don't either anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's renting now. Yeah. But I'm saying that I, but you I couldn't do it. Right? That's why I left. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's they can. You guys gotta read. You you get to inspect your paperwork before you close on your house. That's part of your inspection. Is your deed restrictions or your CCNRs, covenant conditions and restrictions, and it governs what you can and you can't do. That's part of your uh, discovery period. It's called as a buyer. Okay. But what's happening the last few years is that super lean priority laws is putting a lot of these paperwork people aren't reading them. And homeowners all across the homeowners associations are all closing on your property. This will say somebody different thing real quick. I, I have one well, it's a real one now, but it was my home one time. And I felt like the HOA wasn't good enough because now if it's a rental, now a lot of the homes in that street are rental. Right. They don't enforce anything. And sure. I feel like my property value has went down. 
Yeah. Because of that. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that she'd be over the top like grass and things like that, but I mean. How old is that? Can I just ask how old is that community? Not even 10 years. Not even 10 years? Wow. Yeah. And I feel like that a lot of people aren't maintaining their properties now because they turn into rentals. And the HOA is not. What well, why do you think that's interesting that they turned into records? Did the original homeowners first all live there? Yeah. They all first lived there? Yeah, it's kinda of like starter houses for people. So for the smaller homes. Okay, and then you had an exodus and people kept them instead of selling them? Yeah. Almost everyone. Almost everyone? That's yeah. so interesting. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's, 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 yeah. So anyway. Do they have HOA? Yeah, they have HOA rules that say well we we call this it was all good. Uh, yeah, but, sure. But I'm just saying that I feel yeah. like HOA can be beneficial too. Yeah, right. Absolutely, I'm with you. I'm like I'm all I'm all for it because it keeps everybody in check. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, if they come in, don't do nothing for it. Like I, I would love like a park for my kids or yeah. a school or yeah, something. Yeah, there's a park in that neighborhood. Yeah. But when the builders are destroying actually the street you live on, uh -huh. and your neighbor's doing this and the house man is garbage, uh -huh. and they're coming over here sending you pictures of your mailbox flag is up or your mm -hmm. Yeah. Your gate is open. Or, <laughs> it's like stupid I'm stuff. That. My it's, husband actually was mowing the park in the entrance to the thing every week because even though we were paying fees at one time and now we don't you pay fees. Of course, we were mowing everything because they weren't mowing it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, it's either you have the crappy ones or the, the ones that have no sense. Yeah, you know what? You know what? You know what sucked for me was when the city, one of the city, I had a rental property. In, and a duplex in called that we want to meet, we want to updo the, the neighborhood, and they did a slideshow of the bad properties, and the first house was mine. <laughs> <laughs> and the house was good, but my tenants, I didn't know, but my tenants had like a car with a box <laughs> out on the front yard. What is that? I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> the house was fine, but just yeah. like what the tenants did to it, you know, they had like the garbage cans were up front. And, oh oh my god. god. I was like, wow. I was like, don't tell them. Don't, don't say a word. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's pretty sad. <laughs> <laughs> money and how it actually works okay all right valuation and market analysis appraisal what is market value or what they call open market value this is what you see the for sale signs for this property is for sale market value or open market value that is the most probable selling price that is the price you're going to help your sellers to determine What is the actual market price? Sold price, that's what it sold for. What's the market price? That means the same what it sold for, not what it's listed for. Okay, appraisals. Appraisal, what is an appraisal? An appraisal is an opinion from a professional appraiser. And you can send 10 appraisers to the same exact property on the same day and hour different from each other showing up. And they will all come up with a different value. Every single one of them. All right. So it's their opinion. Their opinion on what something is worth. Only an appraisal appraiser can determine value. You as real estate agents or real estate brokers or professionals cannot determine value. You can say your property, based on the information I have, your property should sell between here and here. And then... Throw the ball at them and say, you pick the price. All right. Do you want to be the one that picks the price? Heck no. Make sure no one trips on that. It's over there. Okay. All right. Here are your steps in the appraisal process. Okay. The first one is going to be state the problem. State the problem means that you're getting the job order to go appraise the property. What is it for? Is it for a first loan? 
Did the property sell or is it being uh, appraised for insurance? They want to find out what, what's the problem. What am I trying to solve here? All right, so they may ask you on the exam, what's the first step in the appraisal process? It's going to be state the problem. Or you might get a question, what is the last step in the appraisal process? And if you look up here, it says prepare the appraisal. But when they ask you the last step, prepare the appraisal is not going to be there. But what is going to be there is the reconciliation of data. So what's going to be your answer? That's right. The correct answer is not going to be there, but you're going to go for the next best correct answer. There's all sorts of reasons why you're going to have a uh, appraisal. A home appraisal, you can be getting conventional loans, FHA loans, VA loans. They're going to find out what it's for. There's several levels to appraisers. First one is appraisal trainee. You haven't even taken the test yet, and you're working pretty much for free. Some states have made it so difficult to get an appraiser license. And I got to tell you, in Mississippi, our average appraisal age is like 74. In the state, Anybody get an appraisal lately and see their appraiser? No? You have to work a year under somebody before you can take the test in the state of Mississippi. And if you know I'm training her and she's going to be my competition in one year, am I going to train her? They can't find people to train. So we have very old appraisers right now. They're going to have to loosen it up for sure. Okay, so that's your appraiser trainee. Licensed real estate property appraiser. All these properties, okay, see that number 250,000? I need to, you to be able to recognize that several times on the exam because it's like that three. Remember when you see three, what is it most likely? The same thing's going to apply for $250,000. So you need an actual license at the $250,000 level. What is your money insured up to a bank to? 250,000. Then we're going to talk about uh, capital gains exclusions, 250,000. So they want to make sure that you know that number. So be prepared for that. So you need a license. Your first license is under 250,000. When you're certified, it's something, a property that can be over 250,000, but it can't be really complex. It can't be like uh, 100 units or an office building or something. And then you have the top, which is the certified general property appraiser. Okay, you guys know that I come from a military family. I was a military brat, like it's someone else in here was. You were as well, on um, were. Okay, and I always see that word general, I always think the highest, or the most important. So when I see general in the appraisal, that's what it is. That is the highest rank in appraisers that you can get. And he's unlimited on what he can appraise. The Uniform Standard of Professional Appraisal Practices is your ethics in real estate. Okay, this is what you're going to be following if you're an appraiser, USPAP. When you see URAR, that stands for Uniform Residential Appraisal Report. That is the form they're going to put the appraiser appraisal on, and it's a standard form. Has anybody ever looked at an appraisal? Their appraisers? Pretty cool, huh? Okay, excellent. Okay. Here's the way an appraiser is going to estimate value. He's first going to, he already, well, he should already understand that there's four economic factors or independent economic factors. You have desire. How many people want it? Utility, how useful is it? Scarcity, is it beach property where it's scarce or is it inland? And is it transferable? Is it tied up in court? Is it whatever? Okay, and I call it dust. You also have, you also have economic uh, principles and property characteristics that are going to, to uh, determine or affect the value of a property. And it would be social. How old is everybody in the neighborhood? Right? Uh, economic, how much does everybody make around here? Government is going to um, affect the value of the property. Are they giving us an extra tax in this neighborhood? Are they put, have they decided to emit domains of property across the street? Okay, so the government can affect it as well. And then, of course, environmental forces. Is it a super fun site? Right? Do I live next to a, a polluted water well? 
Okay, supply and demand, principle of supply and demand. Here's your question. Here's one or two questions you can get with supply and demand. The first one's going to be a developer was building a group of homes in a neighborhood. And after he built the first one, he realized that the demand for his home was constant. Okay, what does that statement mean? Demand for his home was constant. Somebody always wants it. So basically, when he sold the first one, he probably had multiple offers, right? That's how I would interpret it. And then they're going to ask you, which home most likely sold for the least? The first, the first one. Yes. Excellent. The first one. If they don't ask you which one most likely sold for the least, they're going to ask you which one most likely sold for the most. Last one. Last one. Excellent. Those are your supply and demand questions. Excellent. Anticipation. We're back to Dan Brown, the master anticipator. That's deciding to sell or not sell or making a real estate decision based on some type of expected future event. A woman decided to hold off on selling her house because she believes that well, she just heard that this factory come into her town and bring in 5,000 jobs. What is she basing her decision on? Anticipation. There you go. When an appraiser does look at a property, he's going to look and say, what is the highest and best use of this property? What can I use this for? And I love this highest and best use because to me it's very subjective. But again, I can't determine the value. Okay, so an appraiser is going to say, is this best as a single family home? Is this best as a grocery store? Is this best as a fraternity house? And that's the position of which, where they're going to start to determine on how to appraise it. Value and use, very subjective. Very subjective. The, um, Dan Brown again, the guy who uh, did the reverse condemnation and Dan Brown went in and offered him money and brought that property with a freeway interconnection was the guy selling it saw his property for what the other neighbors were eminent domain ads that's all he wanted that's he saw that as a valueless property Dan Brown saw it as a business property so their value and use was different I bought a fraternity house I bought in fact I bought the crack house and the frat house in the same month yeah, there was, there was there was more crack in the frat house than in the crack house. <laughs> when I bought that house, I decided never to rent to college students. I was like, I can do that. They're not a protected class. Look, it doesn't say college students here. It says race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familiar status, and national origin. I can discriminate against college students. <laughs> And I did. And oh, any attorneys in here? <laughs> I'm not an attorney fan either. <laughs> All right. So, the value and use, when I bought the fraternity house, it was really interesting. It was a fraternity house right outside of Cal State Long Beach. Um, and the fraternity got thrown out of school or thrown off campus or whatever because that house, the fraternity house they lived in, caused so much problems and too many complaints and blah, blah, blah. And it was, it was, a, you, can, you know what frat houses look like. All right. So when they appraised it, the appraiser came in and appraised it as another fraternity coming in and buy it, buying it. What's the demand for a frat house? Low. Low. I saw it as an office live workspace. And I turned to, so I bought it as, as my, the appraiser appraised it as a fraternity house. I thought it was undervalued because my value in use was I was going to put my real estate business down here. I'm going to make that into a one bedroom apartment and I'm going to live in a 5,000 square foot home above that. And that's what I turned it into. Okay. So value in use is very, very subjective. I can have one fourplex and I can call three different buyers. And one will say, um, it doesn't produce the same or the, the cash flow that I'm looking for. And then I can have another one say, it's definitely worth it. I may have to pay a little bit each month, but in four years when I sell it, I'll be able to send my kids to college. So it depends on what you plan on using it for. That's your value and use. Conformity, this is what homeowners associations are based on, is the conformity of the neighborhood. There's a theory in real estate where neighborhoods that maintain a certain look will keep their value when they talk about amenities 
Amenities are things you'll find in a homeowner's association that are off your property. So for instance, you guys are talking about community parks or community pools. You guys said you had a community pool? Okay, a community pool would be an amenity. A community park would be an amenity. Features would be a pool in your backyard. See the difference? So amenities are off your property. And I always think those are like really loud areas. Anybody live up against a pool, public pool? Community pool? Is it loud? You can hear them? Yeah, well that's why I always say they're off my property, amen. Right? <laughs> Amenities, they're loud. Okay, and then the features, they're gonna talk about a, a community pool and I'm gonna talk about a pool in your backyard so they're different. One's an amenity and one's a feature. A feature may also be a four car garage. Okay, it's something on your property. Depreciation. How much did that building depreciate? The appraisal is going to look in that. Look at that. It's going to combine that with wear and tear. Okay, but I want you to repeat this. This is going to be a question and answer a couple of times. Land does not depreciate. It's not okay, that's right. So when you're either appraising it and trying to figure out the condition of the building or the depreciation of the building, you don't take the land into consideration because that's not going to change. Okay, the depreciation is on the wasting assets. You see how that works? Oh, that's a question. Um, names on your front and your back. You guys are all spinning on Terry. me. Terry, thank you. Terry's saying, what about, okay, your land doesn't depreciate, but what if what if you're on like a, a river and the river is coming closer and you're losing? You get a canal. Or a canal. I have to look, look my house on the back and you're losing. You are. In fact, erosion is, is a way of transferring real estate. You're transferring to someone else if you don't take care of it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, I don't know how that's considered into depreciation because I know the land itself is not going to depreciate at all. They're just going to take whatever's wearing away. Yeah, you can always rebuild a brand new house on the same property. Yeah, so sure. I think sure. If, you, if you have waterfront, don't you, um, if you don't build it back out, don't you lose or gain land? You can lose and gain land by either a uh, being on a river, a beach. Do you ever see beaches that develop? You just gain real estate, or it's washing away, like you're saying, and you're getting closer, closer to your house. You can, that's a way of transferring real estate. So yeah. I don't know. Yes, yeah. sometimes you can build it out, sometimes you can't. Depends on where you're at. That's right. Because but you do have excellent. Thank you for saying that, Jet. Yeah, Jet said, um, and he wasn't here for the water rights. On, he said, sometimes you can build it out. So on a littoral, if you have a literal water right, can you, in, or let's say that you're allowed to build decks out into the water or a boat pier out into the water, can you stop or build it out so far that big ships can't get down there? No, no, no you can't. Okay, you'll, you'll read about uh, literal water rights in riparians. Thank you, that was an excellent question. Thank you for that. Okay, um, so depreciation that's just gonna be on your land. I don't know how to answer your question, Terry. That's okay. <laughs> Anybody have an idea how to answer her question? <laughs> you have the same problem? What's going on with your property? Here's your, your microphone. Turn it on. <laughs> she forgot. There's like a stream next to my house, and um, actually, the property behind my house are pulling some of my trees back down, and then the, um, the city had to come in and rebuild the fence, uh, but they put a chain link on. Anyway, um, so on the left side, there's like a little stream, and you can tell, you can tell the ground is soft there. So I'm going to have to do something about it. Yeah, eventually. do something about it, sure. Do you want to do you want to lose your property? It sounds like it, it's eroding. I was about to say, yeah. that would be where it's zoning. Wetlands. They would have to wetlands, yeah. The city would have to look into that. Can you call the city or? 
Anyway, yeah, but stay here. <laughs> <laughs> because if you can smoke something to your house, that's what you, that's you know what I mean? So they would have to almost rezone that area to, to give it to the waterway or whatever it is. I don't know. There's so many. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, it, that's why real estate is so interesting. You go to court, get an attorney. Let's see what they decide. Or let's talk to the city how they plan on doing that. But definitely look it up. Because that is, that's yeah. good news for you. Anyway. Definitely look all that up. For sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go oh, Okay. All right, um, physical deterioration, this is just the normal wear and tear from aging on a property. If they ask you for the definition on this, when an appraiser is appraising a property, he needs to consider other properties. When he's doing that, he only considers what's called a arm's length transaction or an arm's length or more transaction. He does not consider a less than arm's length transaction or, or less than yeah, okay, less than arm's length transaction. Okay, what that means, an arm's length transaction is two strangers coming together. And I was thinking about somebody meeting in the parking lot to sell a car. Do you know that person? No, you automatically feel, and you're, I know for me, I feel like at least taking arm's length away from me. You know, my car's been for sale for a month. You like it here, we're in the parking lot. I don't know you. It's been on the open market for a while. Whatever that is, whatever price is negotiated between those two people, that's an actual value of a property. That's the sold price of the property. Actual selling price and value of the property, as opposed to what's called a less than arm's length transaction. I was thinking, I'm selling my property to somebody I could hug. So I'm gonna sell my property to my niece for half its value plus love and affection. That's a less than arm's length transaction. I sold it to somebody I can hug. All right, they, they get recorded. But how fair would it be if an appraiser took that into consideration to value the house next door? Yeah. See how that would work? The less than arm's length. Yeah. yeah, less than arm's length. So they only use the arm's length transactions. Okay, they don't use less than arm's length transactions. Okay, there's neighborhood stages in every neighborhood across the country. There's four stages. The first stage is growth. That's the stage we have a house, an empty lot, empty lot, house, house, empty lot, house, empty lot, empty lot. Anybody live in a neighborhood like that? Are, is, are, are all the buyers, for the most part, pretty much the same age? Within 10 years? No, my neighbor, she wasn't in the 60s. Really? Did you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> really? It's really like a huge Well, that's interesting. Well, now, I mean, well, for most, uh, now that you're saying about everybody coming down here, yeah. it's like that everywhere. Oh, you guys, that's right. We're getting a lot of retirees yeah. down here right now. In several oh, neighborhoods. Uh, wow. Neighborhoods just, especially military, too. Yeah, community. that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, nobody retires. Yeah, nobody retires. Right. <laughs> okay, usually the, the stage goes. <laughs> Mississippi, I got to tell you, you guys. I get to tell you, you guys have messed up one of my friends so bad, it's not even funny. And I'll tell you what happened. Okay? The growth stage, traditionally, or what the theory goes is in the growth stage, historically, not here, um, <laughs> people of a certain age within 10 years apart will buy those new homes. Has anybody ever grown up in a neighborhood with all the kids in the neighborhood? That's because that's what happened. Your parents were all, and the buyers were all about the same age. So all the kids grow up together, and as the neighborhood goes and goes, the same age group tends to buy the same new homes. But now we're dealing with retirement communities, too, plus the military. Okay, so see how that works? That's your growth stage. That's when the kids are little, the kids are just being born, they just bought it. Your stability stage, this is when the kids start go elementary school, junior high, high school. Kids are mowing the lawn every four days because their parents make them go out there and get some exercise. That's when your property, or traditionally speaking, or theoretically, that's when the neighborhood is at its peak at that point, the stability stage. Now, think about it. What happens when all of a sudden they're leaving high school, they're going into college, or they're getting married and they're moving away? Now you have empty nesters, right? They might not need that space, but the original homeowners, if they're still there, do they care if their, their lawn is mowed every four days? 
they may hire somebody they don't want to spend as much as they would if the kids did it for free do they care if the windows are cracked in the back or they wait a couple years to fix it all right you see how the decline is starting to happen okay then you hit um you hit the stage where they die off or they get put into uh homes or i'll see that a lot man in the houses you go from that being your neighbor for 20 years next thing you know Gone and then when people thank you when people inherit a property i can tell you a lot of them don't even live in the area when these kids inherit the property what do they want to do to the property yeah. Yeah. dump it say so dump it cheap don't they okay that's where you're going to start seeing your revitalization the people who buy those homes traditionally historically are uh, the people that have vision they usually like up what i found out later when i was in mississippi I was teaching a or designing a class on how to make money in real estate, how to build wealth in real estate. And and when I was looking at the, the buyers and the revitalization, I knew they were younger and they were like the hip artistic type people type thing. And then it said traditionally the gay population with single females are the ones that drive the revitalization of the cities, the inner cities. So that made sense to me after all those years. Why I did that? Okay. So anyways, revitalization, that's where that's where I used to go. And um, you guys cracked me up in Mississippi. It cost me a lot of money. <laughs> right. I thought, I saw a neighborhood, and it wasn't obviously, this is, you know, Detroit. You know, it's going to be like, this is an extreme. But uh, when Jim and I were looking for real estate, I, we flew here on a Saturday, and I bought a property on Sunday, and I was never here before. But we were looking at real estate going up and down streets, up and down streets, up and down streets. And when we hit the street that I lived on, there was like all these 90 year olds out mowing the lawn. And I was like, oh my God, Jim, this is like the place. Because I'm thinking, I'm thinking like the new hip people <laughs> are going to be buying this property soon, right? And then, so we, there was a house for sale. It was, it was for sale by an investor who was just flipping it. And we're like, yeah, we'll give you the money for a flip. I don't care, right? So I was standing in the driveway, like, that freaking guy died and his 80 year old son moved in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was so pissed. <laughs> I was like, so we're still there. <laughs> this is the longest I've ever lived in a house. I actually have to remodel the kitchen. I mean, I've never had to do that before. <laughs> so, so you really, you guys, I don't know, you guys live forever here. <laughs> it's the water. It's the water. It is the water, actually. All right. So, anyways, it's a, yeah. <laughs> you guys, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Okay. Then revitalization was what I thought my neighborhood would do, but I still got people alive on my street. It's, it's amazing. It's unbelievable. <laughs> oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> what time? What time? This is horrible. It's horrible. I know. I wonder who's waiting on you. Yeah, I know. My niece. My niece. I know. My niece is waiting on me. She's like that crazy lady. That crazy lady down the street. What's going on? Oh, oh, no. Oh, yeah. No, I'm looking for mobile homes. They have mobile homes in there. Do you think they're built more for Mississippi than No, I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. No, I followed, I followed a fire truck one time right to my street. I was like, I know it's going to my street. I got right behind it. And lo and behold, it went to my street. I, I, I stopped, I talked to the guy's son, he's like, you know, 75. <laughs> I'm like, what's up with your dad? He's like, what's up with your dad? I'm like, what's up with your dad? He doesn't live there, the son doesn't know. Okay. Um. <laughs> Did you like push him in the shower or something? No, I was like, what the hell are you doing? Well, we went to the Boulder Bar drinking last night. And I was like, come on, dude. <laughs> come on already. 
Oh, you got to flip her every now and then. It's awesome. It's awesome. That's really Apparently cool. not. <laughs> 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 you know, people riding in car crashes in California. It doesn't work for you here. Yeah. <laughs>
and especially in the crack house that I bought that particular neighborhood, it was kind of sad. By the time I did it, it really was because by the time I sold that property, the landlords were happy, but the tenants all had to leave because the rents went up so high, those original tenants couldn't afford it anymore. Okay, so a whole new type of demographics moving into the neighborhood. Okay, see how that works? It's called gentrification. So you gotta be you try to be aware of that when we're going to the neighborhood, but that, I mean that neighborhood went so okay. Um, okay, re increasing returns, decreasing returns. Did you have to, you look like you're always ready to ask a question. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, increasing, decreasing returns. Okay, what can you do to a property that's going to add value? Paint. What is it? Remodel in general. Maybe. Bathroom. New windows are good. Paint, paint's my first thing I go to. Cosmetic. Yeah, cosmetic, I call it putting lipstick on a pig. So the insulation's good. Huh? So the insulation's good. No black holes. No black holes. No black holes. That's right. No black holes. All right. So you guys get the idea of things you do to increase the value of the property. Okay. Decreasing returns. Oh, boom. Jim. Yeah. It may or may not. Yeah, that can go either way. Pools can go either way. I'm not ready to blow mine up. That's true. He said most of the time you don't get your money back on a pool. It's like rims on a car. It's like rims on a car? Yeah. Yeah. Especially when they buy expensive new cars. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, can they give me the rims to keep the car? Oh, yeah. No, I had, I had a millionaire client that the stereo was more than the car. Jeez. <laughs> Dude, why? Okay. All right. So obviously there's things that you, you can't add anymore. It's not going to add any value. Okay, see on this block on the left where it says refreshing? That's what happens when you buy the biggest house in the neighborhood. Your value, you may add a million dollars worth of stuff, but because you're in houses that look like that all around you, comes a point it doesn't matter anymore. There is nothing you can do to your property that's going to add value. That property is going to suffer from regression until other bigger homes get built in that area. And now, if you look at the next one, the next block, you have progression. That's what happens to the smallest property in the neighborhood. It might be 800 square feet, but it can go for a million dollars if there's million dollar property, two million dollar properties all around it. Sure. That goes back to the, the arm length you were talking about valuation. That goes back to what? The valuation you were talking about. Valuation? You know, a standard transaction or a value, yeah. Yeah, you're not going to base any of those on less than on one transaction. Right? A lot of the residential areas around here, the inspection court places in frame with fire, mineral, and so much square footage. That's right. That's part of your zoning. That's yeah. one of your government regulations or your police power zoning. Thank you for that. Especially in newer communities, it's going to say this or the, the zoning. It's going to say this is single family homes, but the homes have to be this square footage. And your lot size has to be this size lot. All right, so you see a lot of that now. Police power, okay, that zoning, excellent. Okay, you have physical functional obsolescence that also affects the value of the property and external economic obsolescence. Let's start with physical function. What's wrong? <laughs> My fraternity had a staircase that was you, is, is there really a house that has an issue for parking? The garage, garage door's on the wrong side. Wow. No, my fraternity house had one of those stairs that with no door. I made it a, a planner with hanging plants. Like, hey, words. Okay. Um, so, anyways, but you can fix that, can't you? Sure. Physical function obsolescence. You can fix that. Those are things that are on your property. Now, external economic obsolescence, these are things that affect your property outside of your controls, like being in the path of an uh, airport, 
or living on the train tracks. Who said he lived on the train tracks? Was that the guy, my friend that was in here today? Yeah. It's not crazy about being on the train tracks. He still made $5 million. All right. To get used to the train. I think they're pretty cool. Pretty cool. Okay, so economic external obsolescence of things you cannot correct. You cannot cure on the test. You're going to say cure. C U R E. Okay, we're going to, I'm going to go through the three methods of the appraisals. Well, the methods that they use to appraise a property, but before we do that, I'm going to give you guys 10 minutes. This is a really cool chapter. And the first approach to valuation is called sales comparison approach. Um, approach. Okay. They may actually call it, I'm going to sit down to see if you get it right. Okay. Let's see. Get this over here. Okay. Powered at all? There we go. Okay. So skills comparison approach is called. This is the first one. All right, skills comparison approach. They also have, um, they may call it market data. Market data. That approach. This is how you're going to figure out how much your home costs, your single family residence is going to cost. Okay. First of all, what they're going to do is they're going to go and try to find the value of your house. So let's say this is your house. Your house is going to be called the subject house. Subject house. And I would say, don't touch my house. We have to figure out how to adjust the, the comparables. Okay, let's give yourself a pool. We like a pool. Okay, the appraiser is first before he does anything. He's going to go look at your, your house. He's going to pull up all the data on it from the county, see how many square footage, any other sales information from the history of the property. And then he's going to go look at it. He's going to say, okay, it's in pretty decent shape. I know a pool in this community, no matter what, adds about $10,000 value to the property. So then he's going to go out. And he's going to find at least three comparable properties. Comps. There you go. Let's put in comps. Comps. All right. So let's say he finds this house, but it happens to have a patio. He finds this house. Then he finds this house, has a patio, and a pool. properties that sold as close in time as the day he's trying to find the value to your house. So did it sell yesterday? Did it sell the next day? Is it the house next door? What about the house down the street? It's going to be as close in time and as close physically as possible. They're going to say, okay, this one sold for two. This one sold for 190. Information. Hmm? Some good information. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm kind of pulling it, pulling it together. Get some good so. um, within, it's a, it's a neighborhood. Okay, so some, you guys spread out stuff around. But I have seen um, the new zip codes, the same zip codes, or in the same subdivision, or the same. It's, it's going to be again. It's going to be opinion of the professional appraiser. Well, they're not going to use a house that sold 10 years ago that's too far away. Okay, if it's too far away. And we'll talk about how you would handle the value of a house if, the, if nothing sold around it for that long. We'll talk about that. Okay, but this is like a standard neighborhood where single family residences. Okay, so then he's going to take your house and go and say, okay, now what I have to do is I have to make these comps or comparable properties look like the subject house. But I know, don't touch my house. Okay, don't touch your house. The last one sold for 210. 210, sorry, my hammer is not real good, but I do my best. Okay, so he's gonna look at the first one. He's gonna say, okay, this is very similar. It sold for 200,000. It doesn't have a pool, but it does have a patio. And I know patios in this neighborhood will add about $5,000. So what he has to do is he has to make this house look like that house. So he's going to pretend the patio's not here. 
So what does he do? Subtracts. But what does he have to do now? He has to add the pool. How much for the pool? How much is this property value? 205. Okay. Now that this house, yay, we did it. It looks like that house. All right, see that? Okay, so let's draw a line. Let's figure out the next one. Okay, so he's going to say, all right. What was that, 205? Okay, this one's at 190. It has no patio. I don't have to worry about the patio, but it doesn't have a pool either, so I have to pretend there's a pool there. What's he going to do? Okay, so what's this one? All right, so now we're at 200, 205. Now this one sold for 210. It has a pool and a patio. The pool's good. What do we do? Subtract 5,000. Subtract the patio. Subtract the 5,000. Where are we at? 205. So now that these three properties look alike, we have 205, 200, 205. Does he have a good value of what your property is? 200. 200, you guys think? 205. 205. 205. Yes. Yes. Does he, when they do these appraisals, though, do they also go off based off of upgrades in the home? Because what if the home that's for patio and pool has brand new hardwood, been painted, new roof, new fence, but if this one has no fence, it's got carpet throughout, needs painting, and needs a new roof. Can you still estimate it compared to that? Well, one? you're going to also use, okay, this is the basis of where they're going to start. So what are you going to use? You're going to start looking at wear and tear. Start subtracting. Right, or adding. Or adding. Maybe this one had, uh, was in bad condition, had whatever, bad roof, but to put a, we have to put a new roof on it. Again, we're going to add or subtract. Okay, so keeping it simple. Okay, let's get rid of these, these here. All this. Let's start on over. It's much easier. Okay. So what they're going to ask you on the exam is going to make this the subject house. Okay. Then they're going to say the comparable has a $5,000 fireplace. Where do you add and subtract and how much? Right, the subject house doesn't have it. You're going to subtract it from the comp. How much are you subtracting? $5,000. Okay, that was easy, right? Right? Okay, now let's. It doesn't matter. They're just asking you what you add and subtract. Okay, and that's what I'm trying to get you because that was an excellent question because I'm going to show you exactly how the question goes. Okay, and don't, you guys, I'm telling you, don't overthink this question because this is going to be one of your long questions. All right, so let's say this one has a $5,000. Patio. Now, where do you add and subtract? You add it to the comp. You're going to add the five thousand here. Okay. This is how the question really goes. Okay. It's going to be one of those. It's not. Remember, I told you those superfluous questions. They're super, super long. They're going to make you feel like you need a calculator to finish it. Okay. All right. They're going to say it's either either one of them is going to have some type of five thousand dollar upgrade. All right, so let's say this has the $5,000 fireplace, okay? But they're not going to make it simple. They're going to say and give you a bunch of superfluous information. They're going to say, Bob owns this house. The comp is owned by Al. Bob bought his house in 2000 and 2005. Al bought his house in 2010. Bob paid 115. Al paid 205. Bob put in a new kitchen for $50,000. Al put a new, uh, a new rug that cost $8,000 in it. Then he took out a second. You guys starting to see what's going on here? Yeah, yeah. Took out a second for $150,000, and it's being financed for 30 years at 8%. Bob's original loan, he only has the first on his loan, and his is a 15-year mortgage for 80% of the price of the property. Guys, start to see what's going on? Yeah. Right. They're, they're trying to confuse you. You see that? It's 6%. Does any of that matter? No. No. It doesn't matter. It, then they're going to say, where do, you, where do you add and subtract and how much? 
No, what are you going to do? The 5,000 to the top. You add, where do you add and subtract and how much? You, this does not matter. None of that matters to the question at all. Okay? It comes right down again to none of this because all they're asking you is this has a 5,000, they're going to say the subject house. Has a five thousand dollar improvement. The comp doesn't. Will you add and subtract? It's all that question comes down to. But they're going to add about two paragraphs of how much they paid, how much they financed, how much they spent on improvements, how much they did this, how much how much they took a second out on. Does any of that matter? All right. So don't start overthinking that. Don't pull out your calculator. They're going to try to get you jumbled and make you panic because you're going to see a bunch of numbers. And what's horrible about it is question number one, the answer to number one will say something like, this is just made up, okay? They'll say something like, uh, uh, Al has to subtract $30,000 because his loan was 30% uh, less than Bob's. And if you do the math, it's correct. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then number two is going to say something like um, Bob's house needs to uh, subtract $15,000 because in 1985 he did this or he did that or in 2010 he did this and did that and that added a certain percentage and if you do that math that's correct you guys get that so one two and three are going to make if you do the math they're correct why do they do that why they do that yeah. You got to really know it. All right. But does any of that matter? No. All right. All right. So watch that question. It's a superfluous question. Okay. You always move. You always move the comp. Always move the comp. You make the comparable property. Make the comparable property look like the subject property. Okay. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter what they paid for originally or anything. You guys good with that? All right, excellent. Let's take this share around for a minute. You guys online got that? Yes. 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 One more time. No, I can't get this off. Yeah. Can we get the share off here? Yeah. Okay, now we've got the share off. Yeah. Yeah, we're sharing the screen. Maybe we'll take it off when I go over here. All right, hold on. Let me pull that back up again. There you go. Huh? Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. Get off there. <laughs> There you go. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for that. All right, so back to this. So this is considered the market or sales comparison approach. This is your regular property, your single family residences. And it's as basic as it can. In the book and online, I'm going to give you this scenario we just went over. The date of the, of the comparables is important. Like we said, it can't be 10 years out, right? It can't be 10 years away. So they're going to ask you what's important. The date's going to be important. Okay. So what happens? What do you do here? What do you, what do you change here? You add the 5,000, right, to the comparable property. Excellent. What do you do here? Okay. Excellent. Does it matter how much they paid when they bought it, whether they took out seconds or thirds or any of that mathematical stuff? No. Don't let those numbers panic you. They know for most people, numbers panic people. All right, so when you see that question, know it's easy. All right, and they're just giving you a bunch of stuff that you don't need. Okay, the second type is replacement cost or summation approach. This is on your special purpose buildings. This is your uh, church, hospital. There's a hospital for sale in Gulfport. Do you think that an appraiser is going to go, gee, let me go appraise that. When was, what hospital sold in the last three months in this zip code? <laughs> None, right? So what they do is they walk through the building and figure out how much it would cost to rebuild this building, the same identical building with new materials. All right, see that? 
How much would it cost? On this question, though, they're going to ask you, um, all right, we added it up. What's the last thing you're going to do on a cost approach? What else has value? The land. The land. Excellent. You're going to, yes, add in the value of the land. Okay, so that's the last thing you're going to do. This is for your libraries, your city hall, churches, hospitals. Things that you don't have comparables for, they're going to call them special purpose buildings. Okay. You can do re reproduction or replacement costs. Okay, so if you're going to do, again, replacement costs with submission, you're going to do reproduction if it's a historic call. I know it says replacement up there, but you're going to also going to be reproduction. Like that's, that's um, Elvis's home. Do you think they're going to put new type doors in there? Or are they going to look for doors that are historically correct? Historically sure. Correct. If you're looking for things, or when they had a rebuild Beauvoir down here, right? They had to look for things that looked like they were old, even though they were new. Do you think that costs more than a regular cost approach? Sure. Yeah, a lot of them are custom made. Sure. Absolutely. The cost approach is used primarily um, if it's not going to be a transfer of the property, it's going to be how much insurance is, do I want to insure this property for? Or the insurance company is going to come in and say, how much would it cost to rebuild this if Katrina came and blew this away? Okay, so that's going to be your cost approach. So replacement cost, equally desirable substitute, reproduction cost, these are your historic homes. And it's going to cost more. When you're looking at replacement cost, and we talked about what if there's no comps that's 10 years out that the last property sold? This is the way they word that similar question. It's the same concept on the test. They're going to say, a new home was built on a farm, brand new, for a family of, they'll say a family of six, they're going to give you a whole story. Family of six, they wanted four bedrooms, but they ended up being able to like get five bedrooms for the same price as the four bedroom. They're going to give you all the financing on it, what they added, what they didn't add. It's going to go on and on and on and on and on. And now they wanted a price because they want to go from a construction loan to a regular mortgage. How is it going to be appraised? Replacement cost. Okay, so you are going to use a single family residence who's nothing to compare it to. It's going to be your replacement cost. So that's the same thing. If it's the nearest home sold 10 years ago, you're going to use this. Okay. All right, so you guys got that. The quantity survey method, this is extremely time consuming. Um, where the appraiser is going to go around, he's going to just instead of saying, I don't know, in this size house, we usually have uh, X amount of copper wiring. They're actually going to measure the copper and wiring. You love to measure every inch of it. Okay, it's really, really time consuming. The last one is unit in place. Not only are they going to go actually measure everything, they're, uh, they're going to add in how much is it going to cost to get everything transported to the property. Okay, the third type, the third main type is the income approaches. This was my baby. I love numbers. I'm good with that. Okay. You have a gross rent multiplier and a gross income multiplier. And I'm going to make this easy for you guys to remember so you pass the exam. If your goal in here right now is to pass the exam. If you think about it, if you don't pass the exam, you're never going to hang around with the people that like flip properties and sell properties and do all the fun stuff, right? So that's your first number one goal pass this exam so you can get out there and learn the rest of it. So this is what you need on income approaches to pass the exam. We're going to start with what's known as the capitalization rate. A capitalization rate on a property is going to determine the rate of return. How quick am I going to get my money back? So it's your return on investment. They may just call it the cap rate, C-A-P, they might call it, or they might just spell it all out, the capitalization rate. The first one we're going to go over on the income property is a lot of the ones that I dealt with mostly because I love to stay for and below units because that's, instead of, buy, I can tell you, instead of me buying a, a 20 unit apartment, I'll buy a fourplex and a fourplex and a fourplex and a fourplex before I go out and buy a 20 unit building. Because I think about selling it. Who can, 20 unit apartment building, minimum 30% down. Who has that? How about a fourplex? Zero money down. 
or you can get a, a, a grant, first time home buyer grant, right? So again, that falls into supply and demand, okay? So when I see this R in the middle of that, G-R-M, I think residential, take that R. Remember, you're gonna take those letters and get, get the answers. Residential, one to four units is residential. All right, so this is what you're going to use on your re on your residential income. I mean, on your residential properties, one to four unit. If they say that there's a person who's going to be buying a single family home to rent, what are you going to use? GRM. In, in real life, they're going to use uh, a comparative comparable method in this, and then reconcile. Them. Okay, but when they're talking about renting it, you're going to use the GRM. And what they do is they add up the gross yearly income. I do have clients that add up the gross monthly income, and I do that. That's how I do it. I figure out my monthly income and my, what my monthly bill is, and then I, that's what I decide I'm going to buy it on. And it's not on what the rents are coming in today. It's what the rents should be coming in today. Because a lot of these things get valued at what the current rent is, and a lot of them are under-rented. Right, so I always project it on what it should be or what it could be. All right, so this is where you get good deals, especially if they have long term tenants. Chances are they haven't raised the rent, and the value of the property is worth what their rents are. So it probably looks really bad on paper. Rents, renters have been there for, year, for years, they're paying $400, it should be $750. I don't want to move them, they pay on time, they never bother me. Blah blah blah. Here's my gross rent multiplier, here's my number. Does that look bad? Rents should be seven fifty. Okay, so you go in and you buy it. You raise all the rents to seven fifty. Now, what's the property worth? Almost double what they were. That's right. It almost doubled just there. You made a what? A couple hundred thousand dollars just by bringing the rents up to market rent. Right? You see how that works? Yeah, that's why this is my area. I like it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Gross income multiplier. This is going to be, I take that I, investors. This is where we're going to find all the real investors, the big guys. Okay, this is going to be on your commercial properties, your commercial residentials, which is five units and above. And instead of the gross income, they're looking for the net yearly income, meaning what they're going to do is how much does it take in and how much did it cost? Never consider the loan and income properties. The loans are not considered when you're valuing the cap rate or the income multipliers or the rent multiplier and using the mortgage. Mortgages are considered what's called incidental. Huh? You, when you're valuing your gross rent multiplier, your gross income, well, your gross income multiplier when you're subtracting the expenses, you do not use the expense of the mortgage. Mortgages are not consider it, considered in valuing property because some people might be paying cash, right? Is your mortgage an actual needed expense on an income property? No, you chose to get a mortgage. You could pay probably cash, right? All right, so you don't consider that when you're figuring out the gross income multiplier. And what, the, what it's going to do is it's going to find your capitalization rate, and the capitalization rate is what gives you your, your rate of return. Okay. So in the real world, appraisers are going to use several methods to determine the value of your property. They may decide to do um, other types like square footage method. method. Oh, well, what does this neighborhood get per square footage? You know, or when you go to build something, how much do you charge per square footage? Right? So they're going to reconcile all of those. Okay. A competitive or comparative market analysis is a tool that you're going to use as a real estate agent, whether you're a broker or a salesperson. And you cannot determine value because the only one that can determine value is who? Appraiser. Appraiser. That's right. What is it again? An opinion. What form does he use? Yeah. Uniform, <laughs> U-R-A-R, very good, awesome. Okay, so, but a CMA, what it is, this is what you're gonna do when a seller calls you up and says, um, I wanna sell my house. Where is it, right? You're gonna answer, where is it? And okay, and here's something that's not on the exam that I wanna give you that I'm surprised a lot of agents don't use. You guys ever use the Google map? Yeah. Google the 
I'm in front of my computer a lot of times when I get those phone calls and I will Google the address and hit maps. What's that do? Brings you right to their house. I don't even have to put the city in. Brings you right to their house. And then I put the little satellite on instead of the street thing. And then you know that little guy that you can put in front of the house? I bring that guy in front of the house and I return their conversation and I'll say, oh, you mean the house with that red door? Unless you got an older picture and they're like, nope. Oh, you painted it. Awesome. You painted it. Hey, come on, selling. You painted it. Awesome. That may help them the street value, or the, the value of the property. But you're familiar already with their house. All right, you can actually turn the little guy around, tell him what's across the street. If you live across the street from that guy, like, does that guy still park his boat out there? Right? <laughs> Did you just connect with that person? You just connected with the video. <laughs> All right, connect with your people. Connect with your people. Take some sales. Take some sales courses. What was that? Oh, I said, or else you're a stalker. Or stalker. Yeah, don't be a stalker. You guys, I will tell you, thank you so much for bringing that up. That was awesome. Because your clients are stalkers. Your clients are going to stalk you before they meet you. When you have an appointment with you, they are going to Facebook your name. And they are going to Google your name. All right? So you are going to be stalked by your clients before you meet them. Glad you brought that out. All right. You stalked three brokers yesterday. What would you find out? They're very naughty. They used to be um, not a appraiser. Um, the other one that breaks deals a lot. Um, oh, mortgage banker? No. Oh, who breaks deals? Mortgage banker? No. Um, <laughs> investigate. Investigators. Yeah. And, uh, you think they stalked you too? And did you make a phone call to them? Not yet. I will. She's talking. Yeah. 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 But, uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> when I look at their yeah. Facebook, I look at the, and I found from there where they work, and then I looked up where they work, and then I looked up where these people's in the company, yes, and then? I looked up how many lights in each person. Before you even called them, huh? Yeah. Before. I'm telling you, before your clients meet you, they stalked you. Oh, I stalked everybody. Clean up your Facebook. <laughs> Clean up your Twitter. <laughs> Clean up, or if you have to hire somebody to, like to, to like hide that time you, you got really drunk <laughs> and you did something really ridiculous and you got pulled over, you know, you might want to like, if it's on Google somewhere, some news article, you might want to hire somebody to clean that up. But get rid of your drama. Alright, get ready to draw because they are gonna start you. Okay, so a CMA is going to be when you when the person comes up and says, I want to sell my house. I'm telling you, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna look up before I meet them. I am stalking them before I look up when I think about it. I'm gonna like totally Google their name to see if that property just that person just died and I'm actually talking to the son of the property. Right? See that? All right, are they just trying to dump the property? Or are they, gee, do they just have some type of public record happen? I know in some states, you look at divorces. Ooh, they just got divorced. In this you can go to the county website. You can go to the county you know. website and find that stuff out. Actually, they got so many sites now for pennies. Right. They just look. somebody's phone number. You can pull yeah. up whole life. You guys, I want to know what I'm walking into. Okay? But after oh, you do that, funny. what are you going to do? The CMA, what you're going to do is you're going to find out the square footage of that property. You're going to take the information that the seller gives you, and then you're going to look for comparable properties that just sold in the neighborhood as if you were an appraiser. Okay, this house down the street sold for 210. This two streets over sold for 215. This one sold about four months ago. That was at 210. What's it tell you? Just right there. Four months ago, 210. Now you're at 215. Leslie. Let's do that. Two seconds. Leslie. Where do you where do you go to find these comp prices? You're going to have access to the multiple listing service. And your MLS Okay, thank you. Your property sells, you have to say it's sold and how much it sold for. Thank you for that question. That was an excellent question, by the way. Zillow Zillow is your enemy. Okay. <laughs> what is it called? Domestic. Uh, Destimate? Yeah, Destimate. Yeah. Zillow is the thing that you're going to spend most of your time, your objection, sure. for those of the, who have taken sales training, that's your biggest objection in real estate. Zillow's going to tell Michael that his house is worth 275 but not 
person in this neighborhood has sold for one penny. <laughs> and they called you because they think there's a ton of profit in it, and they saw that 275. I want to sell my house for 275. I'll take a little less to make it 270. <laughs> <laughs> and you got comp on Zestimate, they were 150 to what? They're like, well, I'm looking for what they sold for, and they're like, that 190. Oh, very good. All right. Her, you went to the actual they sold for price. Yeah. Sometimes I'll tell you a tax history. A tax history, yeah. yeah. Very cool. Yeah, look at the tax history, really. It tells you the real thing. But you got how much less? Like $450,000? Like the one No, it was like a, um, it was like a, Like all the houses on the street were bought or were made in like 1974. 1974. Uh, I love that year. Those, I, I love old. I love old stuff. I do. Yeah, they're very new. Yeah, they're very new. All right. So yeah. So you're going to be dealing that. That's excellent. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So what you're going to do is you're going to prepare the CMA comparative. They might call it competitive market analysis. They change the name depending on what part of the country is, but everybody calls it a CMA. It's a product your broker is going to show you how to use. Most brokers have software for it. Okay, we just fill in a bunch of stuff and it's got to print out a report. Then you're going to bring it to your your person. And I don't give them a price, I give them a range. The value of your property is, and I don't know how your broker handled it, it's going to be between, this is what I found. This property sold for da 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 three months ago. Does this kind of look like your house? Yeah, it looks like the same square footage. Da, 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 da. Your house may be in better condition. Or, and then this one just sold, and you know this house, yeah, it's like two blocks over. It just sold for this. So I'm thinking somewhere in between here. What do you think? That's what yours did to you? They, what do you think? Because they want to throw the ball in your hand just in case it doesn't sell, right? Because the worst thing is to have a seller come back. You told me it was worth 210. I just got an offer at 175. You want them to make the determination. All right. So that's your CMA, your competitive market valuation. Okay. Your AVMs. We just talked about estimates. Mississippi is a closed record state. But last, about eight months ago, I went to a convention with um, Zillow. In, uh, in Denver, the headache city, I call it. Um, in Denver, and we go to Denver, so high up, get drunk fast. Ooh, I got a headache, like crazy. What was that? You got snowflakes? Oh, nosebleeds. You guys remember, I have like a hearing aid in. I got snowflakes. You got skis? That's where all the UFOs are? Oh, that's right, the airport UFO. Oh, I love all these conspiracy theorists. <laughs> all right, the math. Okay, so estimate is your enemy for the state of Mississippi right now, but it's getting, and you, these people came out and talked to us, and they're getting real accurate, even in the state of Mississippi, because you're a closed record state. What they're doing here is they have access, a lot of them have access now to the MLS. So your properties may not be recorded in county records which are what's closed, but if they have access to the MLS, they're seeing what the agents put in that it closed for. And they're also searching all your um, building permits. Did you add on something to your house? They're going down, they're, they're getting records of all the permits of all your counties, all your cities, all your states. And then they start adding that up as well. And now, what do you hear the scariest thing I heard at this convention? You know that little guy on Google that walks in front, you can walk in front of your house or the house that you're gonna be listing? They have a version of that that they can put that person in front of your house, look through your house, and and measure every room in your house, and see if you had any improvements done in your house. They are getting very accurate, extremely accurate. Invasion of privacy. I don't know. They have all sorts of technology that they can like literally look through your walls. All right, so that was pretty scary, I thought. But anyways, they're getting very accurate. All right, I don't know. Yeah. Huh? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Foil. Oh, I love another conspiracy theory. All right. Um. <laughs> okay, you guys. There is a um a, a pamphlet that the Appraisal Institute has that I love called Understanding the Appraisal. You guys, it's free to download if you want to download it. All right. Why don't you guys? Give you a All right. Huh? Give you a